to interest you in the importance of, of personhood or selfhood. Uh, the, the prevailing viewpoints in our field direct our attention principally either to disease states or to unconscious processes of one kind or another. And what I want to contend, <coughs> I want to, want to contend for, with you to, today is the idea that, that the identification and alliance with a person, personhood, is as fundamental as these other prevailing orthodox preoccupations. That's, that's my, uh, my mission. And um, I do that for a lot of reasons, one of which I've given you at length last year, that is the idea that, or the, the pretty firm conviction we have today, that the outcome of our efforts <coughs> is perhaps determined more by the quality of the relationship, the quality of the relationship between persons, than it is by anything else. So if the outcome of our work is significantly affected, perhaps most significantly affected, by the quality of, of the personal bond that is formed in the course of the work. Now, there's another reason why this is important, which I'm not going to go into at great length, although I'd love to at another, on another occasion. Because when we talk about persons, we're getting as close, when we talk about persons, we're getting as close as we seem ever to get in our work to a concept of health, of health, of what is, of what is working about the person. Now, this is a, this is a subject dear to my heart because it's so neglected. Everywhere else in medicine, health is the first consideration. In any examination of the patient's body, the predominant findings are all healthy findings. And the illness is put against the background of details of health. Now, we don't do that. And therefore, all our suspicions of pathology <coughs> must be suspect, since we haven't found a boundary of health. And I don't pretend to have found it, but I want to, I want to, I want you to think with me about how we might, how we might use the concept of personhood to begin to make a health evaluation, so to speak, a routine part of our own procedures. Now, what do we mean by a person? What do we mean by a person? <laughs> what a what a joke. I mean, what, can we, I mean, on the one hand, it seems so obvious, isn't it? You know, we see some, we get someone's name, we have an idea of what they look like, we may even shake their hand, we have a biographical sketch of some kind. So we think we have a person. We have a person. <coughs> and yet we know we don't necessarily have a person at all, do we? Because this idea is so simple, is full of obscurity, isn't it? Most of us try to put our best foot forward. <laughs> so that when you meet us, what do you meet? <laughs> well, you meet our best foot forward. <laughs> some of us, some of the saddest among us, put their worst foot forward. And then we don't meet them either, because their worst foot is what we meet. <laughs> so how, how, do we, how do we know that we've met a person? Now, there are lots of clinical situations where we're pretty sure we haven't. Imposters, of course, are a classical instance of that. Multiple personalities, which person is the person? And then there's the whole gamut of instances where there doesn't seem to be anybody present at all. Schizophrenia is partly, that's often significantly true of. But then there are many working, very successful people among us famous people among us, who if you knew them, you would wonder whether you could find anybody home. The most famous of these are actors and actresses. There was a wonderful review of a book at the Times, just a book review just a week or so ago, of Eleonora Duse, what do you say, a great Italian actress. And she used to say of herself, outside of the stage, I do not exist. When I was a Young man, my first girlfriend's mother, my first girlfriend's mother was a famous radio writer. 
and she came back from a trip to California and an evening she spent with Charlie Chaplin. And she said it was an extraordinary experience because he would either sit there glumly eating his dinner or else he would jump up, go away to his bed, would come back in a new uniform and she would then proceed to carry out a part for 15 or 20 minutes. This went on for four or five hours. <coughs> so like many actors, he was really only present. He was really only present when he was uh, another part. Read, read Laurence Olivier's autobiography. Or think about someone like Marilyn Monroe. You know the famous remark about Marilyn Monroe when a photographer said of her that she was the most extraordinary person he ever photographed, not because of the way she looked primarily, but because you never had to tell her to pose or anything. She knew exactly what you wanted her to do. She knew exactly what was in your mind. And I suspect she didn't know at all what was in her own. So these, these tragic, these sad instances are, uh, are very abundant, <coughs> often among people that, are, that travel in influential ways throughout all our lives, really. So what can we say about personhood, meeting a person? One thing, one place that I start and that I and then I would argue is central to the concept of person, is it's not being a unity. It's not being a single thing. It's being a mass of conflicts, a mass of differences, a confusion fundamentally is at the heart of personhood, I suspect. There's a story I told you when I was talking here last year about the Persian king. The Persian king, you remember, had his face stamped on his palms. And he was in his, in his uh, royal home, and a woman came to him who had walked all the way from the other side of Persia to see him, so the story goes. And he asked her why she had come so far to meet him. And she said, I saw the coin. I saw your face on the coin. But everyone, everyone tells me you are a kindly man, but your face is cruel. And he said to her, or is said to have said to her, now you know what I have been struggling with. Now you know what I have been struggling with. A cruel disposition even. And on the other hand, an idea, an ideal of kindness and helpfulness. <coughs> I think this is close to the center of what we mean by personhood, this, this struggle, this effort. And we see it at different times, at different places in the course of a person's life. I told you another story last year which I love dearly, which was Lincoln's remark about the human face. Remember he said at some point in his life, no one is responsible for their face until they're 40. <laughs> I would say that I would put it up to 50 or 60. And I think that 40 might have been right at 18, 50 and 5 or something like that, when you didn't live much longer. But I think it comes even later for most of us. What do you mean, responsible for your face? I think what he meant was that you had somehow learned enough about yourself, and most important of all, decided what parts of you were central to be, to be avoided on the one hand, or to be developed on the other. You had come to know sort of who, not who you were, but sort of who you strove to be. But that arduous process might really not have reached the point of of responsibility until you were well along in your life. I certainly know that's been true of me, and I don't propose to, that I've got there yet. But I think it's commonly, commonly the case. I told you a story last year, too, about Lincoln's face. Now, I'll, forgive my repeating it, but I love it so much, I have to tell you again. Yeah. Lincoln often talked about his face because he didn't like it. 
He didn't like it. He thought he was ugly. He'd shave off his beard, they grow it back on, he'd all kinds of things, he'd grow his hair, then cut that off. He wanted to change his fate, but he didn't like it, right? And the story I told you last year, which I love so much, is occurred in a courtroom when, uh, when Lincoln was accused, Abraham Lincoln was accused in the courtroom by the opposing attorney of being two-faced. <laughs> and you know how you know how the story goes. He, at the end of the trial, right, making his summation to the jury, he said, "Gentlemen of the jury, there were no ladies on the jury in those days. Gentlemen of the jury, do you suppose? Do you suppose? Do you really think that if I had two faces, that I would wear this one?" <laughs> And you feel it at the poignancy, the poignancy of his discomfort with, with, with himself. So maybe, maybe what we mean by self, what we mean by selfhood or, or personhood, and I'm, and I'm only going to make tentative suggestions about this, and I'm looking for you to tell me what you think, how we should think about this. Maybe a central part of what we mean by personhood is a sense of struggle. Reaching, and when we reach a person, it's a sense of having reached some of the elements in their struggle. Something like that. Now I want to try to illustrate a little bit what I'm talking about by mentioning two types of cases which, in my experience, present some of the greatest difficulty in the identification of, of self -hood. I mentioned one of them already, schizophrenic people. And those of you who have had much experience with schizophrenic people know that the symptoms often replace any personhood in our attention. And that's understandable. And there are ways that that can be done, too, successfully. But we often don't feel like we meet anybody, anybody recognizable among schizophrenic people. And I wanna, I wanna make a suggestion of how you deal with that. Because it came to me relatively late in my clinical life, but it's been very helpful to me, and I hope it might be helpful to you. One of the central issues, one of the contestants in schizophrenic people's minds, in my experience, is a contest between conventionality and unconventionality. Many schizophrenic people hate convention. They feel victimized by it, and they are. In their families, they were always the outsider, the strange one. They have always, not always, or always, but many have spent their life in a condition of sort of, what would you call it, sort of moral exile because of this. And when you can't find them, it will prove sometimes the case that they are hiding because they don't think you would want to really know them. And what they fear that you wouldn't want to know is how different they are from conventional people. The great Sullivan once said that the ranks of the schizophrenics, or I think he said dementia precog, but the ranks of the schizophrenics are drawn largely from the non-suave. <laughs> And I think there's a lot to that. People who don't have the conventional attributes of social being. So from that, I concluded that if I really want to reach a schizophrenic person, I better reach what's unconventional about them, what's uh, perhaps remarkably fine about them. And many schizophrenic people, you will, you will discover, <coughs> when you know them, represent a concept of sort of human connection of human decency, of human uh, reality even, that you would never imagine from first knowing. And that if they feel you really care about that intimate moment when someone is revealed and not disgraced, you can sometimes find the beginning of a person, a personhood that can then exist more comfortably in the world. And then there are those cases which, which are also terribly difficult, and they're more familiar to us because they come more unexpectedly to our attention. These are scattered people, scattered people. You know, you, you meet them and 
One minute they're high, one minute they're low, one minute they're talking about this, one minute they're talking about that. There's, there seems no center to it at all. Right? Now when you have someone like that, I suggest that you think this way about them. How can I sort of settle myself down first, settle myself down first, and not be distracted by all these scatterings that are thrown at me? My pebbles. How can I hold myself steady in the center and see if I'm quiet and look at the person carefully, quietly, and not threateningly, hopefully? Maybe I can find someone in there amidst the scatterings that I can relate to. Now, in my experience, when I've done that successfully, what I often find in scattered people is that no one has ever taken them seriously. And you can see why, because they're all on the map. But no one has bothered to, or maybe been able to, reach whatever is in there as a person that is somehow not to be taken seriously. Not to be taken seriously. We have, you know, you know, you, you know as well as I do, that we have all kinds of ideas about, about how to classify human beings how to uh, orient ourselves in relation to different types of people. But one of the most important features of people that one wants, wants to identify, in my experience, is whether they can take themselves at all seriously. Some people take themselves too seriously. But a great many of our patients have extraordinary difficulty taking themselves seriously at all. And because they are so gifted, really, at dissuading us from taking them seriously, we play into that, we play into that, invertly into that effort. Well, now here I babble along, what time is it? I babble along on this, and, <clears throat> and the question I wanted to get to was, how do you know when you've met someone? How do you know when you've met someone? We had a discussion about this this morning at the PGY4. Who is it? Was he, is he here now? Who is it? Somebody told us something. Some, what, did you, what did you say? Talk about, uh, speak, speak loudly. Interacting with people and sort of the, you realize that interacting with the person is the moment of the course of stop. I don't think, I don't think, say it louder. Really, stand up, stand up. Um, talking about the situations where if you're interacting along with somebody, you suddenly sort of find yourself compelled to stop this other activity, you know, you're taking notes while talking to a patient, and you say something, and suddenly you just find that you have to stop. Not because you think it's inappropriate, but because you really are completely passionate about the experience. Right. He, was, he was talking about how he, he, he uh, would be writing notes and something patient was telling him, and then something would happen, and he would stop the note taker. And that was a signal to him that something else had come through, which maybe was larger or more pointy or something. It might be the sign. Now, I'm, I'm going to make four or five suggestions as to how I noticed, in addition to this, how I've noticed that I'm in the present, that I've gotten to a person. Uh, but I, I, I don't, I really, would, I think we should improve on this list considerably. I'm waiting on your, your improvements. One thing I've mentioned already, I think we, we often have a sense of reaching someone when we understand what they're struggling with, what they're, uh, what they're uh, trying to put together to make a life. Right? The often opposing currents of their personal life. That's one, that's one thing. It's also often said that, that you find a person when there's a sense of comradeship, when you have a feeling of, of sort of being with someone, of being together, of joint interest, or something of that kind. A very distinct sense that, that the patient and you, or you and your friend, or anybody, are, uh, are sort of in this, in this together. And there's something to that too, I think. Many people have said, many people have said that, that we only know a person 
when we have a distinct sense of someone's uniqueness. The existentialist, Rollo May, would make a great deal of this in his writings, for example, that, that when you really have <coughs> met someone, there's a, almost a kind of an aha experience, as if maybe for the first time, at least for this person, you have sensed who they are. I, I find that not so easy to, to achieve. And maybe that's my failing. But uh, I, I, I have achieved it on occasion, but I find that very difficult. And I think I can find people before that crystallizes. That may be my, that may be my failing. And then there, then there are those who, uh, who like to say that, that you've met someone only, they say, you have met someone only when both of you change. When both of you change that the experience of, of ex experiencing personal change is the experience of meeting someone. Because if this, this claim is based on the fact that if I know you, if I really have reached you, that will impact on me enough so I'm, and maybe even only small ways, a different person. Now the other, the other, suggestion for how we know when we have met something. I take from Martin Buber. Uh, Martin Buber thought that the, that the great sort of interpersonal act, that the great interpersonal act was something he called imagining the real. Imagining the real. In other words, to be able to imagine what this person's life is like enough so you could speak for it. Sometimes you'll find yourself saying, uh, I bet you've always hated asparagus. No, no. you're unlikely to be right about that. Uh, and it's not important, but it's the kind of, it's something that comes out of your experience with yourself and something you've noticed about asparagus lovers or any other, any other phenomenon of that kind that makes you say, is this you? Can I... Can I imagine what, what you would be like? And of course, there are, there are a hundred more prosaic and sensible examples of that. For example, I, you sometimes find yourself thinking with a, with, a, uh, with a patient or anyone that something like wanting to say, Have you, haven't you always been interested in X, Y, and Z? Just as a, as you imagine what this person might really like. Sometimes you'll be right, sometimes you'll be wrong. Sometimes you'll, you'll find yourself extraordinarily, extraordinarily, surprisingly correct in things of that kind. And I suggest that when you get, if you want to investigate personhood, that you try that now and then. To do that, though, you need a mindset, which I want to just say a word about. Most of the time in clinical work, we're thinking. <laughs> Most of the time we're in clinical work, we're thinking. Right? And indeed, our educational system it's, encourages us to think. <laughs> we, don't know, we don't know how to think right in psychiatry, but we're, we want to think. Right? And, um, and that's a valuable thing to do. We want to get the diagnosis straight. We want to think we've understood the person. There's a, there's a lot of thinking that, that we do clinically. But there's another thing I would encourage you to experiment with. Stopping thinking. And just trying to enter the thing sort of blankly. And see what occurs to you. See what occurs to you. This is, this, I've told you, I've told you this story many times, too many times also, but you know the famous story about Robert Cross being absent from his, his uh, Dartmouth classroom. Dean is sent to find the, the great poet, and uh, they find that he's disappeared into a nearby forest, and, and they, they, go, they track him down in the forest, and, and they ask him, Mr. Frost, whatever they call him, what are you doing? What are you doing, Robert Frost? And his answer is something like this, I'm waiting for something to occur to me. <laughs> Now, if you, think, if you think of what the poet has to do, 
he, he can't just manipulate words. She can't just manipulate words. Something has to come up from inside the poet, which finds words, maybe new words, invents words even, to express itself. It has to occur to you. You can't think it out. And what I, what I, this subject of personhood makes me want to urge you to take a little time in your clinical investigations, and it may grow in amount. Not to think, but to see what occurs to you when you're in the presence of this particular person. Many in, in the in the long course of my in the long course of my psychoanalytic training, <laughs> the long and expensive course of my psychoanalytic training. <laughs> I, uh, in those days, they we used to we used to figure it cost about one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars to get to the Boston Institute. Anyway. I'm, I'm told now it's twice that. Yeah. So in the course of that long, every now and then one of my teachers would, would tell me a story that struck them as so remarkable because um, it marked a clear improvement in the patient. <laughs> we didn't often talk about improvements in the patient. We always talked about that other things, but not improvements. But every once in a while somebody had a startling exper experience with the patient improving. And the context of those events was almost invariably what I just said. Something unexpected had occurred to the therapist, or the analyst, and they'd said it, sort of hoping they weren't subverting the analytic message. And they said it, and that was when the improvement began. So I take it that we are so mysterious, we persons, right, that to engage with us successfully may require a, a perception of each other at a deeper level than our thinking and our theories allow. And that if we allow ourselves quietly and good taste and manneredly to release ourselves from the bounds of our, uh, of our uh, ideas, we may get closer sometimes to the person of the patient. Now I want you to tell me how, how I should have given this talk, and what I should have said about personhood. Come on, kid. You know, you know what I said. You always tell me afterwards. I'm not telling you during the Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. I think you're talking about something that's very difficult to talk about that we don't have much vocabulary for. Um, Do you know Dr. Kuhn? There he is. <laughs> But part of the problem is that, um, <coughs> and you you always use a verb to talk about it. You know, you talk about finding finding a person, or you talk about making contact. And but when we think about things, we often tend to think in nouns. So we think, okay, person. What is a person? You know, they can just uh, these conflicts or those likes or dislikes or this sense of identity, but that what you're trying to talk about is that uh, experience of, of making contact, and it's, it's, that's very hard to talk about, and so we tend to fall back on discussing the now, and I think that the, the example from the back of the room is sort of about how do you recognize when that experience has happened? Thank you. Can I stop now? <laughs> I don't want you. I don't want you to stop. I want to stop, but I don't want you to stop. Isn't thinking often a way we stay out of context even in the song? Say that again. Isn't thinking? Isn't thinking often a way that we stay out of contact even with ourselves? Mm -hmm. And so, isn't it scary for us to stop thinking because? We might have come to ourselves, we might have the other person. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of parts of myself I don't like to have, and I do a lot of thinking. <laughs> How do you do it? How do you know? And some of you are married, for example. 
there's, a, there's an adventure for you. <laughs> you. And presumably you thought you were marrying a person, right? There were two of you back. And you both thought you were marrying each other, right? Now we don't know. It takes years to discover whether you really did get married. But it's, it's possible, right? So you, you have to uh, ask yourselves, how do you know this person? Have you lived with maybe, I don't know, I've lived with my wife for 30 years now. How, you may have lived some of you longer with your spouses. Do you know this person? What are you going to say, Mo? Well, I was, I'd probably be saying the same thing. Not saying, but the feeling of the man in the back of the room that some, everything <coughs> extraneous, taking it off, goes away. And the person that was a poet, Keats, who most expressed it, and it's called negative capability in dealing, let's say you and I, trying to relate to you, find out. You've got to get to this yes, to the yes, book quickly. Yes, yes. That you so lose yourself in the other person, the feeling. Uh -huh. And I think he used the word, like the dyer's hand, a man dyeing cloth, that becomes, the hand becomes that which it works in, the dye. It's not my hand, it's this contact. It's a feeling. Thank you. And the thought goes away. So that in a sense, you part of what Mofort is saying is that, not the whole part, but part of what he's saying is that you find the person when you lose yourself to some extent. Right? I think that's I think that's a very important thing. Do you do you know you, I'm sure you I'm sure we all think we do, do we know our best friend? That's a, that's a term that best friend that is very, very significant for many of us. Many, uh, men don't have many best friends. Women have more, but some of women's best friends are not so good for them. <laughs> but men may, men may often have only one or two real best friends. So there would be a place for, for the men here to as to, to think about that relationship in terms of, uh, of identifying this personhood. What about the children? What about the children? I think there's something about the animals familiar with children that is particularly maybe because stand up, stand up, please stand up. That's a what? <laughs> you never do anything, I tell you. <laughs> That's how you know me. <laughs> so, now, come on, talk more about that. That's great. Well, I've just been thinking about it as we've been talking. Um, I, I don't know. There's something about getting, like, noticing your children as they become people. It's something we'll just catch you, something that they say or something that they do, and all of a sudden you see them differently, you know them more. Yeah, yeah, how about that? <coughs> I think what I feel is related to what... You better speak very loud in this room. The thought that's coming to me, the feeling that's coming to me is related to what was just said, which is that um, I feel like I've encountered a person in a sense, when I'm no longer, I'm sort of captured and transfixed the way you are when a small child begins to seem like a human being rather than just a little blob. And I'm no longer aware of my perception or my thought about who is this other person. I'm actually encountering them and sort of transfixed. It's this moment where you put the pen down, where you put your own thought down, and you're just taken with them on their own terms. It's not, it doesn't involve, they're not a mirror for you or your ideas or thoughts or projections or are they going to have uh -huh. the symptoms you're looking for. They're just uh, fascinating on their own terms and alive on their own terms. And I think there is a moment where, especially 
also in the family has a few children. And very young, I think within a year or two, it's clear that they have different and unique, discrete personalities that just capture the people around them as they're developing. You agree, Marla? I was thinking something a little. I'm going to go out. And, uh, I have another thought. Because right before I came over here, I was I had an encounter with a patient who remembered me, uh, and he said. Oh, you know, do you remember the story you told me about the wine mouth frog? And I can't tell you about it. I've heard this at least three or four times from this particular patient. And that was a moment we shared. And I don't, it was a joke that I told him. And there was a reason I told him the joke. It was a kind of sense of mutual vulnerability. I, the wine mouth frog joke is basically about this frog that, that happily announces it's a wine mouth frog until he finds out somebody eats the wine mouth frog. And then Talks to her and her and this patient, there was something about that with this patient that he was doing this, that I saw him doing it, but I saw it myself as well. And that was a moment somehow that we shared. And you know, it's it's a metaphor, but I think sometimes these things have to be a metaphor. That there's, you know, some common experience that, you know, you're you're able to see a message here. Great. One, one thing I just, as a footnote to this, one thing that, I don't know how seriously you take this discussion. Um, and I suspect that it may seem very peripheral to many of you. Um, because of course we have other interests, like conscious processes, disease states, and the rest of it. But I, I would urge you, passionately urge you, to think hard about it, and I'll tell you why. I've taken care of a lot of people that have, over the years, almost 50 years now, a lot of people who have been so-called very sick, right? And I've concluded that if I can have this kind of connection with somebody, if I can make some kind of, it doesn't have to be for even very long, some kind of connection, some kind of rec mutual recognition, they don't go crazy anymore. And that's, a, that's a wild statement. But they don't. I mean, they may not get better altogether, but they won't, they don't go crazy anymore. It's as if, and I, the first time I heard someone say this to, to me, I didn't believe it either. And, and the man who said it was Elvin Sebre, one of my first, most, one of my most important teachers. And he used to say that there's one, if there's one real person in your life, the real link, you, you may suffer like hell, you'll suffer anyway, you know, but you won't go crazy. That, that you, and I think it took, I, I didn't believe him, of course, at first, but as the, as the years have passed, I think that's right. Now notice what that suggests. It suggests that if me, me, my person, can link up with your person, that connection, will allow my person to stay together at least a little bit or a lot more. Almost as if we can't do it by ourselves. And I think that's true. We need somebody who what believes in us, that's not enough. It or maybe too much. It's one person that is there for us in a sense. One person that, if we have that, the mind seems to have the glue that it needs to hold together. So I think we're talking about something very central. To, to the kind of work you do all the time. I was just thinking the word flow describes it. Flow. Louder. I was thinking what you were describing over there, that the word flow. It's that momentary, sometimes momentary, total engagement with another human being where you are simply in synchronicity. Sometimes briefly, yeah. but it's a total connection. Yeah. <laughs> No one can hear you. No one can hear you. This, no, you're, you're you don't necessarily have to go both ways. If you have an idea that someone um, thinks of you in a certain way, does that person actually have to? Or like if, if one of your patients has an idea that you have a good view of them that helps to yeah. them, do you necessarily have to have that view? Or, or is it more just within the person's mind? I think it's between lines. I think it is between lines. Now, you may not even know that you think that, 
And you may be wrong in certain ways. But I think it has, it's something that happens between people that we're talking about. You know? You know, that, that brings up this whole question in a different form, doesn't it? How do you know when something has happened between you and somebody else? Mm -hmm. eh? Well, you say, well, my God, it took out a gun and they shot me. <laughs> well, yeah, something must have taken place between the two of them, I'm sure. But, but how do you know in, in other more, more ordinary examples that something has really happened? Justice Stewart, when asked to define pornography, could only say, I know it when I see it. <laughs> well, I don't know. I think, I'm not so sure I agree with that. I am. Um, the reason I don't, is that the whole concept of pornography changes year after year. Today, there are things that, that uh, you can say in public that, uh, that, that it would be regarded as appallingly pornographic five, 10, 15 years ago. I don't know whether you were as devoted to the Sopranos <laughs> as I am, but it surely is one of the most extraordinary uh, displays of the use of one single word, once forbidden. <laughs> in fact, it's almost as if it should be the name of the, of the, uh, the show. Right? And in a real sense, it is. Because the F word, which of course I would never say in a public place, the F word is really a lot of what those people are doing to each other. And notice, and notice what happens when they do it to each other. Some of them, even the protagonist, the most unlikely candidate of all, ends up in the psychotherapist's office. Right? Now that's, a, that's an interesting mystery. You know? And he even uses that word with her. But what's the connection between that kind of desperate, furious thing and the psychiatrist? Well, I think you, you and I would know the answer to that easily. If you live that way all the time, you're going to get in trouble sooner or later. Furthermore, the people you think you care about are going to make trouble for you if you act that way. And that's, of course, what brings, what brings, uh, what's his name? Tony Soprano into the office, isn't it? Because what, at one point he wants to know whether he should leave his wife, and then of course most of the time he's wondering whether she wants to leave him. F word. I have a question related to this gentleman's comment, which is about how you now in these days really think about outcomes, you say outcomes uh, uh, determined mostly by the quality relationship. How really in your mind how do you measure outcomes? Well, it's, it's impossible. And, uh, but I mean, how you... the, the, reason, the reason that I claim that probably the most robust finding in all our work is the relationship between the quality of the relationship, the alliance of the persons on the one hand, the quality of that, and outcome. The reason I say that's the strongest finding is that no matter how you define it, now, how would you define outcome? Is it from the point of view of the patient, the relatives, the employer? What is it? It's very hard to know, right? Furthermore, uh, how do you know what the quality of the relationship is? I've been talking about that, but you don't know. But the point is that the, the world literature today <coughs> has attacked that problem with so many different definitions of relationship and so many different dis definitions of outcome, and the findings have been the same. So it doesn't matter what you want to call it, it seems to be connected. Is that the point? No. no. Well, I, but I was wondering how you, how you, like, you know, in the early ap morning hours, how you, when you're thinking about your patients and what they're saying, what you use as methods for outcomes. I mean, you said one, which is that they don't go crazy, but have maybe even more questions. I see. So here, his question is, what, what do we mean by outcome? What do we mean by improvement? What do you mean? What do I mean? What do you mean? What, what do you think about these days? Well, let me, let me give you an example. <laughs> I've been taking care of a, of a man who, like a number of my male patients, has the sort of the great male dilemma. Now, there are a lot of male dilemmas, but, but I've come to think the great male dilemma is he's married, he has children, he likes his wife, he likes the children. He, he, does, he doesn't like his job as much as he likes his wife, but he likes it somewhat. 
On the other hand, he met someone else. He met someone else. And this person brought something into his life, this woman, that he felt he always wanted. And the times he spent with her were like nothing else he'd ever experienced. And so he comes to see me and pay me good money in order to decide what the hell he should do. Where should he go? Now, how am I going to decide the outcome of that? I don't know what he ought to do. I don't know what he ought to do. I don't have that. Maybe the, the, uh, maybe the uh, clergy know what he ought to do. Maybe the lawyers know what he ought to do. <laughs> maybe his financial advisor knows what he ought to do. <laughs> but I don't know what he ought to do. But I do know what I can, what I can do. And I did it. You know, I slowed it all down. I slowed it all down. I just didn't want him to decide. And so I took both sides. I envied him having found this person again. I began to think about my wife. I mean, I want to go to someone else. You know, should I go see someone? You know, it was, a, it was a natural kind of thing that happened, this slowing it down, right? So I would, and I, why did I want to slow it down? Because he couldn't make up his mind. And he had to make up his mind. Now, if he was 15 years old, he was 55. If he was 15 years old, we, of course, wouldn't have worried so much because he's looking around. He's trying to find out. But now he's not in a position where he can do that so easily. So I, first of all, I want, didn't want him to decide. I wanted him to think about it. It turned out that most of the important issues in his life were also undecided, his career, for example. So we had somebody who had a lot of decisions to make, and they're important decisions. His career decisions, for example, as well as the marriage decision, determined what his whole future was going to be. And that's something I didn't want settled quickly. So I slowed him down. So for me, the improvement there was in slowing it, was to slow it down. And uh, is that enough? Is that enough? Not enough. He wants to decide. He wants to decide. He can't wait, wait long enough till one or the other of them dies. That would settle it again, right? <laughs> we, can't, we can't generally get away with that. So there'd be another step you'd like to have taken, right? That he should decide. I wanted him to, I wanted him to keep them both. It seemed like such a wonderful solution. <laughs> so, they, were, they gave him different things. They were both quite wonderful people, as far as I could tell. I wanted him to have them both, and I proposed that. That was my next step. I proposed that he keep them both. Fortunately, at the same time, <laughs> I was saying this. A book was written called, what's it called? Yeah, you've seen it, by a woman named Kipnis. And it's, uh, it's something like Against Love. Against Love, yeah. It's a book called Against Love. And it's, um, I saw two reviews of it. I haven't read it. But they, they were extraordinary, the reviews. Half tongue in cheek. Can't do that, half, half tongue in cheek. But half tongue in cheek, she wrote this book, Kipnis, in which she says, serial monogamy, which is the American way of life today, serial monogamy doesn't work. It's too expensive. It's disruptive for the children. It's a big mistake. If you're going to get married, stay married. Perhaps that's her argument. But if you get married and stay married, you're going to be like my patient. Right? You're going to say, oh, God, I saw this wonderful woman, and I can't get it off my mind, you know, all this business, right? So what do you, what is, what do you think Kipnis recommend? This is so, you see, she had, to, she had to be like Jonathan Swift. She had to be a little bit, she might be a little bit foolish. They want, if people took her too seriously right away, they'd throw a book at her. But she managed to somehow or other hold people's attention so they would seriously consider. What do you suppose she proposed, please? If she, if she says serial mono, monogamy doesn't work, what, what would you then say she would be recommending? What? What? Polygamy might be one thing. She didn't recommend that. She recommended something else. Polygamy is also 
you know, it's against the law too. This other thing isn't so much against the law, if I, can, if I understand the reach of the law. She was, she was arguing for adultery. She said, and, and she, I, don't, I didn't read the books, so I don't know whether it's a brief for what people call the French system. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder whether our difficulties with France from the Bush administration in France has something to do with this whole issue. But anyway. <laughs> but that's what she was saying. That you should be able to uh, you should be able to, you know, do this properly, you know, consideration publicly. I don't know whether she takes that up or not. But uh, something like that. So she said, adultery is better than serial monogamy. Now that's an interesting debate. Neither one of them is everything you want. And there's a, in the New Yorker review of this book, there's this magnificent ending to the review. By some, the review was written by some call, I think, Rebecca Reed. And it was, it'll break your heart, but it's so wonderful. And it, she says, oh no, oh no. She's making too much fuss about sex. It's ridiculous. The real heart of things should be coming together emotionally, understanding each other, making something of life that you have, and to hell with all this excitement about sexuality. That's, that was the end of the review. And, and she did it beautifully. It was really with a, I mean, if you'd been a sermonizer or a pulpit monger, you would have written it down and used it every time. <laughs> Wonderful thing. But what, but what about that now? Is that fair? Now you could say the foremost student of, you've got to stop, but the, the foremost student of marriage in America, in my opinion, is a man named Jerry Lewis. You know Jerry Lewis? He's a Texas psychiatrist, older than I am. And he's, a, he's a remarkable man. And Jerry Lewis says <clears throat> that if you follow, if you follow marriage, now we're talking about marriages between persons now, if you follow marriage long enough, you'll discover that, that um, Those marriages, which I think most people, this is him talking, I think most people would call the most successful, have various features, have various features. Now let's, uh, now I want, I want to return to our topic, because I think his description of these features will be the note of description of personhood that I want to end on. It hadn't occurred to me till this discussion. What do you suppose the learned, wise Texas psychiatrist thinks are the most important psychological features of a lasting marital relationship. Humor. Humor. Close to it. I think it's implicit in some of these things. What else? Well, let me give them to you so we don't have to guess. The first thing he says, distribution of power. Power. No one has the final say in this relationship. That's number one. Number two is both parties in this successful marriage acknowledge at least much of the time that their viewpoint is only a viewpoint, only a perspective, and not the truth. Now, as you know, men were encouraged to believe in one view of marriage that their view of marriage was the correct view or their view of the relationship, right? Today, we've softened that. But that's point number two, that each party to the successful marriage acknowledges it's just the way we see it. Not necessarily the truth. Right? And the third thing he says that's characteristic of a successful marriage is that we acknowledge our vulnerabilities. Our vulnerabilities. Now, so, Here's another way of looking at, of looking at the, what should, you, what should we say, the presence of a personhood relationship between patient and you, as well as other important relationships like marriage. That is, we don't have too much power, we the therapist, we acknowledge the power of the patient, we realize that our view of things is only our view, it may not be as even as good as the patient's, right? 
and finally that we're vulnerable ourselves to various things that the patient says. So maybe, maybe something like Terry Lewis's account of successful marriage 